Welcome to the Heart of Dating podcast. Hey, it's Kate. I'm so glad you could join us this week as we try to untangle the ever so ambiguous world of dating as a Christian. Over here on Heart of Dating, we get real as we answer some tough questions and uncover transformative ways to approach Christian dating. Oh, and you better believe we have some laughs along the way, because last time I checked, the struggle is hashtag real. You know what I'm saying? Now, let's get to the heart of the matter. Hey, hey, y'all. It's your girl, Kate, again. And guess what? We are flashing back to the very beginning once again with the Heart of Dating podcast. We are on a season break preparing for season 11. We can't wait for what's to come. And this episode today, you're getting blessed once again with the amazing John Tyson. I think we like Johns around here, right? Because JJ's actual name is John James, okay? We had John Mark Comer that we reposted his episode. Now we have John Tyson. Look, there's just so many Johns, my goodness. Now this episode that you're about to hear was actually episode 13 of the Heart of Dating podcast. Very first year of recording. I can't even believe it. Listening back is so wild to me. It's like surreal and I kind of cringe, but then I also give myself grace because it was just really early on. But just so incredible to think back about how God really blessed the early years of Heart of Dating with phenomenal guests. I was so honored to have John Tyson on. He is an insane intellectual. And ironically, him and John Mark Comer are actually friends. What do you know? I love that small world. So if you like the episode with John Mark Comer, you are going to love this episode as well with John Tyson. John pastors Church of the City in New York City. And guess what? Fun fact, I used to actually go to John's previous church community, which is called Trinity Grace. So when I lived in New York, I went to the church Trinity Grace that John Tyson was the head pastor of. And that is where I first discovered him. And he has just been one of my favorite ever since then. John has a major heart for serving men. And this last February, JJ and some of our best guy friends and different husbands of my girlfriends, we all went to Tampa to go to the Forming Men Conference led by John Tyson. And these guys' lives were blown. It was so, so good. And also just love to see men rising up to go to men's conferences, right? Isn't that so cool? But I love that John has a heart specifically for men. It is amazing. So if you're a guy listening to this, you definitely need to connect with John Tyson, okay? In this episode, we start off talking about dating, the theology of dating, and why churches so rarely address this topic. And then we move into talking about sexual desire and sexual urges and what in the world to do with all of these things, okay? It is so good. I just remember this interview so distinctly. I showed up to it and we did it in person and John was awesome, you guys. He came with pages of notes. He prepared theologically. He was reading off quotes. He was looking at his notes and I've never been, probably in my five and a half years of interviewing, I don't think I've been as impressed as I was by John and his preparation for this podcast episode. So he just really loves singles. He loves serving people well. He loves serving singles well. And this episode is just rich with intellectual wisdom and all the goodness. So I really hope you enjoy it. Before we get into it, would you do me a favor and rank us and review us here on iTunes or Spotify? It would just mean the world to us. And also, if you want to send this episode or your favorite episode to a friend, it really helps us get discovered and we'd appreciate that so much. So without further ado, here's the episode officially number 13 of the Heart of Dating podcast with John Tyson. John Tyson, here we are. Okay, so the funny thing is, I am so used to hearing your voice right now because between listening to your Controversial Jesus series at Church of the City, and then also you being here in LA for our church conference, I feel like all I've been doing lately is hearing the sound of your voice. (laughs) So hi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having on me. (laughs) Thank you for having me on here. (laughs) Love having on you. I've preached, <laughs> I've preached so many times. I'm like, hey, it's mush. okay. I've just got one more talk left tonight. <laughs> you got one more. You got it. It's gonna be yes. amazing. Yeah, I may. I feel like I may go to sleep tonight, and you may be narrating my dreams after okay. hearing your voice this many times. It's hilarious. Um, okay, so I do want to just dive right on in here because yes. you do pastor a church in New York, Church yes. of the City. Yes. Um, an incredible church. It's been around for how long now? So we actually just started. So this was a. I was a part of a church called Trinity Grace Church for twelve years. Yeah launched out of that Church of the City. So that was in September officially. Okay, that was our official last launch. year so in 2017? 
Yeah, so it's pretty new. Oh, wow. Yes. And I went to Trinity Grace. We were just talking about that when yeah. I lived in New York. Yeah. Incredible church there, too. Okay, so you've just launched a series at your church called The Controversial Jesus. Yes. Which has been incredible. I'm sure you have a lot to say on the feedback. Yeah. and It's been fun. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I can't imagine. Yep. For me, I've, I've loved everyone. I've basically listened to everyone to date. But I... A few of them specifically really touch on some of the things that inspired me to have this conversation with you today. Yes. Being the single, the talk on singleness and the talk on sexual formation, especially for everyone listening right now. I just want everyone immediately after this podcast, don't jump off yet, but after this podcast to go and listen to church of the city, the singleness and sexual formation talks, you just, you guys have to do it. But I also want to tell you, John, that in preparing for today, I sent those sermons to a bunch of heart of dating listeners Oh wow! and I basically said, okay, you guys, you need to listen to this and then send me in some questions and thoughts that you have for John. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. yeah. My whole point so, in giving those talks was to answer questions, questions, not I know, create more. I know, I know. Well, I do think that a lot of their questions they even sent me, I was like, you guys, he already answered this. It's, yes. We're, you know, just listen to the talk again. Yeah. Um, but today's interview, our talk today is a lot of my thoughts and questions mixed with okay. some other Heart of Dating listeners. So When I saw a couple of these questions, I actually thought, this is some of the stuff I tried to avoid in the talk. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I, was, I was just like, wow, these are the hard things. <laughs> These are the hard ones here. So yeah, see how we got we it. We just yeah. go right in. Okay, so let's start with the first thing. What I want to ask you is this. The Bible does not explicitly talk about dating, really. And so how would you come to develop, I mean, the, an idea of the theology of dating? It is true. Uh, relationships in the Bible are so different, such a different culture. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's actually possible from the scriptures to try to, to directly develop a theology of dating. So mm. you would have to come up with adjacent topics that inform it. So what is a theology of gender? What is a theology of marriage? What is a theology of family? What is a theology of friendships? And out of that, you would have to basically patch together your vision. Mm, because there's and nothing direct. That's yeah. correct. Mm-hmm. And then you'd have to understand what is the what is Christian sexuality. And then right. if the goal of dating is moving towards, hopefully, marriage, relationships, that sort of thing, then what is my vision, family, sexuality, those sorts of things. So you can't just pull it straight from the pages. You have to do a little work. Mm, pulling it all together. Okay. So do you want to unpack that for us a little bit? Or you just kind of have to go through all of those different things and that's how we would come up with the theology of dating, Yeah, right? I mean, you would, you would have to do some work. <laughs> some real so work. This I, is why I, we're on the heart of dating. Yeah, doing I mean, I, the work. Here. I had four. My, so my vision of sexuality that I'd put down here, it's also what I shared in the talk, four things. Yeah. Uh, the point of Christian sexuality yeah. is to model the story that we long for. All human relationships point to our relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Uh, our sexuality is holistic. It's not just about sexual technique, which is or dating technique, right? Which is where our culture is often focused. It's about uh, dating and relationships are tied to our transformation. So this is one of the major crucibles of spiritual formation. Though people rarely think about it proactively, mm-hmm. only reactively. Mm-hmm. I've broken my heart. Therefore, what does this teach me? Rather than on the front end saying, "Who am I becoming by what I'm doing this?" And then lastly, I think sexuality is about witnessing to the world about a greater Christian story. So if you've got those things floating around in your head before you even enter dating, or even maybe these are some of the questions you're asking is, Mm. is this pointing to the story of Jesus by how I'm engaging this? You know, all those sorts of things. It's like having a framework to enter it in, enter into it with is better than just winging it. Right. Yes. Which I think a lot of us do. We all want to just kind of wing it. And well, you, you meet someone, you get attracted, you get in something, and you're like, this just feels so great. Yeah. And you move straight into negotiating relationships, understanding one another. You sort of lose the larger perspective. So. Mm, totally. So because you're also you're kind of a student of history, what dating principles do you see in the Bible, you know, taking the context of biblical times that we can maybe transfer to modern day right now? Well, dating, so dating as we know it, it's not just that it wasn't in the Bible. It's just that it wasn't in most of all of human history as well. This is such a new phenomenon. Yeah. So most marriages in history have been arranged or they've basically been business deals brokered through human relationships. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our modern form of dating started with courtship, which is where Mm. people would spend time getting to know each other. Mm. And the word dating didn't appear until the early 1900s where instead of the man coming into the home to meet the family and be assessed for his character, he removed the woman from her family and friends, took her out, and it was all about exciting times and having fun together. Mm. 
And that obviously flows into where we are today. So right. dating culture, then hookup culture, and then apps and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, it is true that you have so much to filter historically before you even get to our current moment. So in terms of the principles, I actually don't think there are any biblical principles that mm. you can look to and say this is how to date. But there is principles on relationships. So yeah. how did people relate to one another? What is love biblically? Mm. Uh, I think those things sort of inform that. Principles of friendship, principles of respect, principles of honor, principles of Christian community. Mm. So those things uh, are really important. And all of that combined, if we had a good, a better framework on possibly all of those things, we'd have a better idea of how to date well in our current culture. Because I think what we're struggling with in 2018 here is the fact that our culture is telling us so much of one thing yes. and then the church may be telling us something else. Yes. And then how do we mix it all to know where we land and how to steward relationships well? Okay. Let me just like reverse the dynamic here. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. What is okay. dating? What is dating? Okay. To me, I would say dating is an opportunity to get to know someone different from yourself and understand and appreciate the way God made them to be. For the purpose of? For the of purpose of, <laughs> first of all, that, getting to know someone else, for the purpose of honoring them and coming together for the glory of the kingdom. Maybe? Okay. Yes? I, 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 I just, I, I, I thought I should have asked that question probably a little yeah. sooner, just to make sure that we're talking about the same sort of yeah. thing. Because mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I think our culture's definition of dating is probably different than what a Christian's vision is, but seeing this thing's called the heart of dating. Yeah. Getting clarity on what we're talking about. I mean, and that's the thing is I say to people all the time, I don't have it all together for sure. sure. I mean, I surely still make mistakes. Surely some, maybe even guys I've dated are listening to this saying, yeah, I know I can tell some stories. That's actually quite brave of you to put yourself out like this. (laughs) Thank you. And knowing that people could be listening, that you've been in relationships with, I respect that. (laughs) Thank you. So what would you say? How would you define dating though? Oh, the, the, the heartbreaking, painful, confusing, murky journey yes. of meeting people, moving towards marriage, I guess, with a vision of moving towards yeah. relational intimacy and fulfillment. Mm, that's good. And I like that I you said the word. I just made that up on the spot. No, right that's there. perfect I didn't come because it's great yeah. that I, ha- I, I say the word murky all the time. Like let's navigate the murky waters, ambiguous yes. territory of yes, dating sure. because yes. of, that is what it is. Yes. So I think – I love that we are having this conversation and all the conversations because no one person can say, I've got the exact way to date. I know exactly what to do. And it is situational a little bit. And so there's not just one hard and fast rule. It is ambiguous. Yeah. Okay. So another question I'd love to ask you is if Jesus were alive here in 2018 and he was dating, how do you think that he would be dating? Okay. Now we're touching on like core doctrinal Christology. (laughs) Yeah. It's just like, who? So. Because we know he was single, obviously. Yeah. So it's like, oh, gosh, I just don't think the son of God was ever going to date. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the question is, what does godly dating look like? Yeah. Or if Jesus was being or a disciple, if, dating yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So here's, mm-hmm. here's my basic take on what happens. The, the problem with modern dating, and this, C.S. Lewis talks about this uh, mm-hmm. in The Four Loves, mm-hmm. is our culture orders those loves in basically an ungodly way. So if the four loves are eros, storge, philia, and agape. So eros is obviously erotic love. Yeah. Storge, that deep sense of friendship. Philia, which is it's like you like someone, and then agape is that sacrificial yeah. other-centered care. Our culture is basically built on eroticism and then kind of being into that person and then feeling great about them as your friend, and then maybe lastly you commit to them. Yeah. So to me, Jesus would not agree with our culture's approach to understanding love. And I think that he would reverse that. And this is what I think is at the heart of what Christian dating does as opposed to secular dating. Mm. We start, so, so if it would be like sex, attraction, friendship, commitment, that's mm. the worldly order. I totally. think, Je- I think yeah. Jesus would reverse that. Mm. So he would start with like committing and respecting someone, then building a friendship and then developing sort of affection and then ultimately leading to sexual mm. consummation. And so I think Jesus would, Jesus would redefine what love is, and then if you find love through dating, he would reorder the process and filters that people deal with that. So you think about a a typical Christian walking into church today. They normally say, who am I attracted to? Who's really hot in here? (laughs) And then how do I sort of like get with them in some capacity? And then 
you hope they've got a great personality, you develop a friendship, and then lastly, you really try and sacrificially care for them. It just feels like the world. Yeah. And so I think so much dating inside the church, there's so many heartbreaking stories because we don't have a different lens about what love is and how to access it. I think Jesus would reorder that. I think the problem, a, a problem with how we function as Christians is that we we also confuse infatuation for love. And I had another guest sure. on where we talked in depth of the science of infatuation wow, and, that's you know, and what that actually looks like and yes. how that wears off after 12 to 18 months. Um, I'll talk about that in my sermon tonight. Yeah. Are you? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, right. yeah. 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 But and not only that, um, I think we also have lost that love of it is a commitment instead of a feeling as well. And so how do we go about like, if things just aren't working, you know, if things are just, we aren't, it's in, uncomfortable for us, I guess. How do we decide if this is something that we should pursue because of love for that person, or maybe that this is something that should potentially end? Well, uh, so, so what's missing in, what's missing in these dynamics is mm -hmm. Christian relationships are not just man and woman together mm -hmm. trying to figure out if it works. Yeah. And then occasionally saying, God, is this your will? Right. I think what they're actually saying is like Christ, a Christ centered relationship takes into consideration Jesus practicing the way of Jesus and a vision of the kingdom of God. Right. So the question, it maybe is more like, are we aligned in a similar mission? Is there a reference right. point outside of this relationship that we're both pointing towards? And is the relationship helping me navigate towards that more fully and helpfully? And if so, like there were, there were the same kinds of people on the same journey going towards the same thing and we can our togetherness is going to facilitate more of the kingdom right that's when you start figuring out let's work through this mm. so you could just the whole human like is this relationship working for me or not that is that is the wrong dynamic when thinking about christian relationships yeah because it's just purely like me versus them rather than us under christ submitting mm -hmm. to one another in love moving towards what he has for us Totally agree. And I think that's why I wanted to bring that up because I think yeah. a lot of people, unfortunately, in our consumeristic culture, we don't we don't handle love that way. We yeah. don't handle relationships that way. We yeah. say, okay, this isn't really working for me. I'm going to leave and go to the next thing now. Yes. And it's really easy to do with a culture where we are constantly satisfied with our needs that we can get instantly, yes. right? Yeah. Well, so kind of different ways to look at, are we on mission together? Are, do our missions and visions align? And if that is true, and if we're like seeking counsel of people around us, we're being prayerful about it, all of those things align, then potentially this is something where we should continue on journey together. It's and, worth, worth working out. Yeah, yeah, completely. Okay. So a few other things for you. So yeah. what scares you about the dating culture today versus the dating culture when you were single and dating? And on the flip side, what are maybe some benefits of dating in today's current era? So I have a, a daughter who's coming up on 16 Oh, there you age. go. Yes. Yeah, so you're started, thinking about this for her. She's just started dating. Oh, wow. So I just met yeah. her boyfriend. Oh, yeah. My first boyfriend was, I think, 14. That was probably a little too young. But yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I have, I have a lot of concerns about modern dating. Mm -hmm. um, and so my concerns for Christians. So in that, that uh, talk that you referenced at the start of this, the concept of sexual formation, yeah. the number one thing Christians fail to take into account when they're dating is who am I becoming mm. by what I'm doing? This is the ultimate question that Christians have to ask. It's not just is this sinful or not sinful, but by the process of formation, what I'm repeatedly doing is shaping me into a certain kind of person and the practices I'm doing are shaping my affections, desires, worldview, outcomes, expectations in a certain direction. So is how I'm doing this making me more like Jesus or not? Right. How I'm treating these people making me more loving, considerate, is the fruit of the Spirit being born, all that sort of stuff. So my concern is that how modern dating works, which as far as I can tell, I mean, I had a text from someone in my congregation say, Yo, JT, I actually <laughs> I asked I a it. girl out live, old school, and I'm on a date right now. And he was like, like live is in, in real live is in like, hey, I really like you. Hey, do you want to go out on a date? And, and it was kind of like a novelty. Mm. So I'm terrified of like the way people come together. So I think yeah. there's an idolatry of romance. I think the way that uh, apps basically manipulate um, the dopamine in our brains to be addicted to you know, looking for more and more people. 
uh, sexualization and hookup culture. Like I, I read an article that I referenced called um, "Date the Dating Apocalypse," mm. and uh, one of my friends I was talking about it said dating apps are like Amazon Prime to deliver hot people. Mm, wow! You know, and someone in that article actually it's said true. it's like seamless, except they're delivering you a person. Right. That is that is like pure commodity. That is sexual exchange. Oh. And then when Christians get in that, it's like heartbreaking. So, so I'll give you a small example. Yeah. So a girl gets on a dating app as a believer and how many penis pictures is she going to get sent to her mm. or how many, what is the small talk being made to her yeah. to get her to respond? Mm. So what, what is her sense of worth? What is her value? How is her understanding of sexuality? How mm. is her understanding of who men are in the world? All being shaped before she's even gotten on a date. This yeah. is just to get you to go on a date. So something like Tinder, I think, is is more like that. So yeah. I have concerns that we've basically turned relationships into a commodity. They're mm-hmm. they're selfish. They're they're based on looks purely. If it's an app based on attraction, and um, that that kind of terrifies me a little bit. In that, do you think that sometimes we base who we ask out too much maybe on attraction? Of course. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying attraction is not important. Right. I mean, uh, when I was, you know, and I hope I'm not being too forward here, but when I was getting married. Uh, so I've been married uh, 20 years this year. Mm, wow. And I, I, I remember like I had two premarital counseling sessions. That was it. And one person said to me, you do realize this is the one person you'll be having sex with for the rest of your life. And I was like, that's what I'm like really into her. I'm kind of hoping for that. They're like, you're into her now, but I, wow. are you attracted to her? Mm-hmm. And it was like, it's, it's, it's important. So I'm not, mm. I, I don't want to dismiss that. Right. But we can so prioritize that over everything else mm. that we miss out. So I think there's probably – so I pastor a, a church probably at least 70% single people. Right. And the number one problem I face as a pastor is that there are so many amazing, single, godly women. Now, they, now men have this false inflated sense of how good they are. And they're just they're, they're looking past women who would be exceptional partners in life mm. because they may not quite be as attractive as they hope for or whatever. And because their grid is off, they're just there's these wonderful, amazing, wonderful Christian women yeah. who, because they can't compete with the world's, you know, idealistic standards or whatever, are getting overlooked. So Christians have to have a different grid when it comes to this. And the way that dating is facilitated sort of works against that. Mm, I completely agree. Yeah. It's super interesting that you say that too, because a lot of the conversations had here, and I always push back when a girl's like, oh, there's just no good guys that want to ask me out. And that, that there's a part of that that's true. It's a complicated situation. I think that, that there isn't enough asking people out in the church is what I've, I'm yeah, experiencing. I, I always tell people, like, people say, aren't you worried your church turned into a meat market? I'm like, where else do you want Christians to meet one another? Mm-hmm, exactly. It's like, I prefer this than at a club, 100%. Yeah. So I so I don't know. I think that's definitely a couple of the the negative things about modern dating culture. Uh, in terms of some of the positive things, so I think something like eHarmony, mm. which is like consciously designed to facilitate whole life attraction, like meaning like what is our personality, what's our background, what, yeah. what's our interests. I think that's fantastic. Mm. So like thoughtful science to try and help you connect holistically yeah. is really great. And I think that Maybe a lot of marriages would have been saved or relationships would have been more ended with a lot more caution if things like that had introduced and helped facilitate relationships. When I started um, doing weddings, I've been a pastor 20 years, when I started doing weddings, the first few people would basically invent stories and I would just say, hey, can I ask you a question? Did you guys meet online? And they're embarrassed. Oh, and wow. now almost all weddings I do uh, are people who've met each other online. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, tons and tons and tons of people like, yeah, wow. we met online. So that has changed and some of them come together because they're like, I actually really connected. Like we we did all the personality stuff and we were matched and it was pretty good. So so to, so to in, in doing away with the pure fear mentality, you know, older relationships, even though there wasn't all the sexualization mm-hmm. and commodification of relationships, there is an opportunity for technology to work to bring to, – to, help you see beyond just the photo of the person mm. and get some background story of their likes, interests, personality, that sort of thing. I think that's like there's something good to that. Do you think that there's something negative about the fact that we ha- always have 
constant access to one another via texting, phone, like back 20 years ago, or I don't know, how long <laughs> did yes, we not have cell phones? I'm 21. There I, you remember, go. Okay. <laughs> I remember life without a cell phone. You, yeah. You probably can't even comprehend that. I mean, no, I didn't get a cell phone until I was like 16. Really? So, you know. Late to the game. <laughs> yeah, late to the game. But yeah, because now we have access to people 24 hours we've certainly day. We've certainly lost mystery. <laughs> yeah. We've certainly lost our ability for people to, you know, keep keep a nuanced distance. Yeah, totally. And as soon as we don't hear from them, like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? And it's just like, <laughs> hey, man, I got a life. Yeah. Yeah. The struggle with constant ability to be in contact with people leaves us feeling anxious. Yeah, well, we, don't, we don't get any time on our own to know who we are, to sit with ourselves, mm, to ask what's wrong. Why did this bother me so much? Like that, that lack of process and self-reflection is dangerous to our humanity, not mm. just our dating life, you know. We have lost the ability to be contemplative too, like yes. just that. Uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. That's what, you know, that yeah. was Socrates, yeah. Yeah, there you go. I wanted to just touch on, I've heard you say this, that um, you've heard it, you've said to singles before to not waste your singleness. And you did kind of speak about this in the singleness talk. So I do believe that as singles, we we tend to grow weary or we hyper-focus on the end outcome of marriage. So can you explain to the listeners what you mean practically by not wasting singleness and maybe how Paul biblically charges us to steward this time well? Yeah. So no, <laughs> this is this is very, very important. So the, the number one thing I want to I want to say about Christians, followers mm-hmm. of Jesus, is that the number one vision of our life is of Jesus and his kingdom. Yeah. All of us have a primary relationship. All of us are married mm-hmm. already to Jesus, to yeah. Christ. We're the bride of Christ. That's so, so important. Yeah, I don't want to rush past that. Yeah. You have a primary relationship. You have been mm-hmm. united with Christ. You are mm-hmm. in Christ. You are loved. You are chosen. You are wanted. You're, I mean, so yeah. it, Christians always like, yeah, 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 I know that. And I'm like, the problems you're having is because you don't know that. Mm-hmm. Don't don't rush past that. So yeah. I think it's important that whenever we talk about singleness, we realize that it's singleness in our human relationships, not our spiritual relationship. Ooh, we are yeah. already united with Christ. So we should at least, I think, uh, when we're talking about singleness, orient our temporary earthly singleness around our eternal vision of being united to Christ. So I think that's important. So another thing that I, I, I think is important to say is that you have to ask yourself the question when it comes to singleness, is this like, so what What am I doing in terms of dating? Is this, is this actually being productive? So I think you have to consciously decide, am I, what am I, do I feel cold to be single? And if I'm going to be single for a long time, mm. how do I do this in a godly way? Mm. So I see people all the time, they're always dating, they're in and out. And I'm like, why don't you just do a timeout from dating? Yeah. And just spend some time developing yourself, working on who you are, working on your, your relationship with Christ, getting those things in order first. Because dating is not facilitating discipleship or spiritual transformation in your life. It's a giant distraction from you. Mm. So I think in some sense you have to to not waste your singleness, have Jesus' vision for it. Mm. And if, if, if you see this, it's absolutely extraordinary. So in the Old Testament, to experience the blessing of God and participate in covenant life, you basically needed to be married, right. have children to produce offspring, and have a some sense of land, like God gave them the promised land that you lived in. And the way you saw God blessed you is that you had large families and a multi-generational inheritance, and you were blessed in the way that you lived in the land. Well, Jesus in Matthew 19 comes along mm. when he's asked about marriage and says there's three kinds of eunuchs. There's those who are born eunuchs, those who are made eunuchs, and those who choose to live like eunuchs right. for the sake of the kingdom. Mm. So he says that there's some people who consciously choose to live like they're never going to be married or have children and that this is actually an opportunity for them. Mm. So Jesus is making a major shift. He says it's not about land. It's about the kingdom. It's not about family. Mm. It's about the church. And it's not about having children. It's about spiritual children. It's about discipleship and evangelism. So Mm. single people, I think, should see the staggering shift in the kingdom of the opportunity to advance the kingdom of God, participate in church life, and make disciples of Jesus. This is not a small thing. Jesus says this is a hard saying, but whoever can accept it should accept it. Mm. So I I wish people at least would consider and sit for a moment Mm. with what Jesus is saying. Mm. There will be extraordinary rewards for single people who choose to live like eunuchs. Mm. 
Mm. So I mean, just don't rush past it. Don't dismiss it. Sit with it. Wrestle with it. Think about it deeply. So I think there's something there. But I, I have four main ideas about why singleness has a value according to uh, Paul. So that yeah. they all start with D. I love De- it, yes. Devotion, mm-hmm. deference, distraction, and discovery. So the basic idea is so that you can devote yourself to Christ at least for a time. Yeah. And the idea of devotion, I think, is something uh, is beautiful. It's a word that basically has two ideas. One is about proximity, to be close beside, and the other one is basically paying attention to. And, you know, a, a lot of people in their lives have deep theological questions. They have questions about God, life, faith, and they never explore them. Mm. So many people email me questions or text me questions and I'm just like, I, I receive that as, a, as an honor that they think I have the answer, that I'm like scholarly enough as a pastor <laughs> yeah. to respond to it. But in some sense, I want to say to them, go look this up yourself. Mm. The joy I found in being able to devote myself, pay attention and learn from God. So use this time to devote yourself to the things of God. Deepen your relationship with Christ. Grow in your identity with Jesus. Learn to walk in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you just be amazed how people never quite get round to that ever. Yeah. So when you're single, you have this unique opportunity to devote yourself to God in a way that married people can't because of basically your time and your season and your focus. Mm. Second things around making a difference, leveraging your margin for the kingdom of God. Now, look, I'm not, I, I live in New York, I know, uh, we were talking uh, before you got on here, you're working 60, 70, 80 hours. Yeah. So yeah. My, my assumption is not that like married people work more than single people. I honor the vocational call of single people. I know they're very busy. Mm-hmm. But what you do with your non-vocational time is mm-hmm. different when you're single than when you're married. And it's different when you're married and you have children. So there is these spaces where you can serve more, right. you can leverage, you can build, you can help. Uh, the next one's about being free from distraction. We just mm-hmm. live in a trivial and spectacular culture and mm-hmm. you have an opportunity to be free from the concerns of this life. This is Paul's thing. He's like the unmarried person is free from the concerns of this life. So you're not getting chewed up by the distractions of the world. And so this is in not wasting your singleness is not like spending your life taking Instagram worthy vacations and doing all the stuff you've ever wanted. It's like, mm-hmm. how do I get free from these things to focus on Christ. And then lastly, it's like a time for self-discovery. Most people have very small and fragile selves. And the best way to enter into a relationship is to know who you are. Self-discovery. What am I passionate about? What are my gifts? What's my sense of call? What is forming me? How do I find joy? You know, what do I hate? So that you're bringing a very self-aware, solid sense of self into any relationship that later you'll enter into. And so when you're single, it's like doing the work yourself. And then you bring your redeemed self-aware self into a relationship with someone else. And most people, if you don't do that, it's the classic. You just become whoever the person wants because you want the person. Mm. And that's when dating just becomes a cycle and it's a disaster and it's unfulfilling. So that's what I mean. you're trying to force someone else to become what you want them to be as well. Yeah, and and if you're lonely, you're just like you you compromise because you want to be together with them. and So that's maybe a few ideas about not wasting your A few ideas, yeah, just a few ideas. I love it. No, that's so good for us, John, because – I think I've actually talked to some people who have listened to your talk on singleness and for them, it's been so encouraging because singleness can be, can at times feel like the term lonely, right? Which is a more cultural term, like this loneliness and it can feel like a deep weight, but when we can reframe it in the ways you just explained, it can be so empowering Mm -hmm. and exciting um, for deepening our relationship, for doing something, for making a difference, for appreciating this time that we have like all this other free time that we have that would be different if we were in relationship and yeah. married. The one thing I would say um, to single folks yeah. is like to cu- to cultivate holy ambition for the kingdom of God. Right. It's like singleness doesn't mean I get to do all the stuff that I'm gonna. I don't want to do when I'm married. Like this is the chance I have now. I'll, I'll settle down mm. later. Now it's like a leverage. Now mm. you won't be able to later. You know? Not in the same way. Do you think at all that people? Like, how can we celebrate singleness, but also not sit in it to such a place that it hinders us from ever really dating? So celebrating singleness is a a separate issue. Mm -hmm. So most churches in America, and it's a little different in places like Los Angeles and New York, most places in America are built around families. So every celebration is a family celebration. I want you to come to an engagement party. Right. I want you to come to a wedding. I want you to come to a baby shower. Everything is like family, 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 family. And every time 
a single person shows up, they're subject to when are you going to get married? Oh my goodness. There's someone right. I want to set you up with. And so the whole time is just around celebrating uh, marriage or relationships. And so I, I think a church has to do the serious um, community work of coming up with alternative moments of celebration, mm -hmm. marking uh, milestones, uh, deep places of meaning uh, to celebrate single people's lives. And so, you know, maybe that can be around vocational accomplishments or personal goals or whatever. But, you know, we actually do a pretty good job of this in our church because we've got people who have a real heart for this. But it's like, hey, this person graduated from this advanced degree they always wanted. And tonight there's a massive celebration. Or this person has been wanting to get a job or get a promotion. So we're celebrating. And so yeah. building all these other moments of celebration, recognition, and belonging for people who are single for their journey is important. And I would say just reclaiming the Christian vision of friendship is very important mm -hmm. um, inside the church. So we should celebrate singleness and we should provide support for single people. Yeah. Um, and I think if, if we do those things well, I honestly believe if we do those things well, healthy relationships and, and dating will come out of that healthy culture. Yeah. So if you build a healthy culture that celebrates single people and supports them, yeah. then all of the dysfunction and the drivenness and the fear that exists in, in dating culture that where people don't find that support will sort of melt away. Yeah. So I think the church has a tremendous responsibility to, to work on this, particularly as we see more and more people being single longer. Mm. So true. Okay, so this question, we're kind of taking a little bit of a different turn, but I'm really excited okay. for this one. So the Bible's view on sex and sexuality was written under vastly different circumstances. Who, who wrote this question? <laughs> Was this, you? this is a, a this was a write-in, okay? So I'm here we go. Okay. Thank you to this person who will remain nameless. Yeah. So the Bible's view on sex and sexuality was written under vastly different circumstances compared to modern Western society. And marriage happened at a much younger age. Dating was not a practice at all, and overt sexual images really hardly existed. So can I just pause for a second? Yes, okay. So I disagree. Overt, oh, you do just dis okay. Overt sexual images were explicit everywhere. Okay. So maybe, Oh my gosh, I mean they had they basically had orgiest, uh, just, just okay. don't Google. Um, they had uh, <laughs> orgiastic like images wow. on on, okay. on plates and on vases in the house and on uh, on wow. their walls or whatever. I mean, okay. the sexualization of the Roman Empire. It was that's like, true. It was incredible. So anyway, so okay. I just had to put that in there. No, no, that's yes. really good. Okay, so they had strong sexual urges, but. Um, Maybe it's fair to say that it is dramatically harder to remain quote unquote pure in our current age with the advance of technology, with where our culture sexually is today. So with that in mind, coupled with the reality that Christians are expect and called to sub maybe suppress their biological sexual drive until marriage, which does happen later in lives, um, what are some practical steps do you think that Christians can make to overcome both the natural and culturally manufactured urge to engage in premarital sexual experiences? Well, so, <laughs> that was that was a long one. There we go. Uh, thank you, anonymous. Question. Yeah, I know. There we no, go. No, since I, like these these questions are really hard, but these are yeah. the questions everybody wants to know. Mm -hmm. They really want to know this. So, look, I want to just acknowledge that sex is a major force in a person's life. It's not incidental. Anytime you get uh, you you dismiss sexuality as a drive in person's life. You're 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 living. You're not helping people. Completely agree. Yeah, we I think the Catholic, the Catholic Church is an example of that. Sex yeah. doesn't matter. So I I agree. I, and I, take, I grew up Catholic. So that yeah. So I, I I take the question seriously. So I, I want to read a verse in response to this mm -hmm. because it contains a couple of key phrases. Mm -hmm. That I think don't give the answer this person's going to want, but they give the process this person needs. Okay, mm. so this is one Thessalonians four three through eight. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, and this is the key part that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. Mm. So that's the first part of it. So you have to avoid sexual immorality and you have to learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Mm. So what does it mean to learn to control your body? Mm. Well, in there, that is about, it's not even perhaps about suppressing, but it's, it's about forming, shaping, redirecting your bodily urges. So it's not just like stuff it down. There's some, there's some vision here about holy, noble, physical bodily discipleship mm. 
And then it says, not, not like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. So now he's talking to the Christian community. So he's like, the excuse that like, hey, man, I was just really into her and my body took over is completely inappropriate for Christians. So I think in that talk I mentioned this idea of, of committing sexual fraud, which is to promise with right. your body what you will not fulfill with your life. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before, for God didn't call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the God who gives you his spirit. So the key here, and so the reason I called that talk sexual formation is that we have to learn to control ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do we deal with these urges? Well, gosh, I, I mean, these can take over your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, these can be so strong and so overwhelming, but we have to like be aware of this. We have to learn. We have to respond. We have to be, you know, I, I'm certainly not wanting to dismiss sin in any in any way, but I think the concept of like what is my attitude and what is the direction of my life are key questions to ask. Mm -hmm. So rather than like is this sin or not sin and am I doing it or not doing it, but like what is the attitude and direction of my life regarding my uh, sexuality? So learning to control, submitting to the Holy Spirit, so a lot of a lot of people's responses to this is just like, look, mate, you've got basically two solutions here. I said premarital sex, but like, but for Christians, like meaningful sex, not promiscuous mm. sex, or just masturbate a lot. That's mm. like people's two responses. Yeah. So I do like, and now I'm voluntarily raising the issue yeah. of masturbation. Which yeah. is fair. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Let's just so, talk about masturbation. So I <laughs> talked about what um, C.S. Lewis talks about, yeah. and I think there's something to this. Like I said, this is getting back to the issue of right formation by repeatedly doing this who am i becoming what's being formed in my mind how am i being shaped so c.s lewis actually has quite a lengthy diatribe yeah. on the issue of masturbation and he basically has three uh, three ideas he talks about this that um when you're masturbating something's happening in your mind that he calls the harem within so in real life uh particularly in a marital sex rather than just sort of like um uh, sex as technique or hookup sex, mm -hmm. you're really deeply taking into account the other person. Otherwise, it's just masturbation with somebody else's body. And Christian mm -hmm. sex has a different vision than that. So so, so inside of a, a committed covenant marriage relationship or whatever, you're always trying to ask the question, how do I please the other person? How do I take into account the other person? When you're masturbating, in your mind, the person does whatever you want. It's all about you. You're the yeah. center of attention. So he calls this the harem within. He basically says like in, so from a male perspective, in real life, to win a woman's heart demands the best of you. Right. But in your mind, it demands nothing from you. You just become selfish. So he talks about the harem within, abusing the imagination, which is like, mm -hmm. Rather than uh, purifying our imagination, and particularly with so many people, their minds just being marinated in violent porn and sexual images. Right. Okay. What is going through our heads while this is happening? And then he also ultimately talks about loving the, the, the person. So sex is designed to draw us out of ourselves into the other person. And so if the response is just like, look, man, this, this is not a big deal or whatever, it's like, well, actually, let's just pause for a second and ask the question, what's happening in your mind? what's happening in your heart what are you thinking about while you're doing this and, and in repeatedly doing this is this preparing you one day to sacrificially love and care for another mm. person so rather than just asking you know should i do this or not do this is this a way to control my urges just i want to step back from that question and just ask what's happening how are you being formed uh, in the process of doing this. The other one that people say is like you know just live together or serial monogamy so now a, a couple of stats yeah. Uh, con connected to this, only one in five cohabiting relationships end in marriage. So they're like, let's wow. try it out first. It's like these are secular stats. These are not, not Christian stats. Yeah. Cohabiting significantly increases the likelihood of divorce. Women who cohabit multiple times before marriage divorce more than twice as frequently those as those who only live with their future husband. And serial monogamy, which is I think our culture's best version, a string of consecutive sexual relationships actually hinders eventual marital satisfaction mm -hmm. while sexual experience before marriage is a good indicator of increased likelihood of infidelity within marriage. Mm. And so people say, well, why? Well, here's what it is. If you spend all of your time doing whatever you want with whatever you want, your appetite, your sexual appetite is being trained 
for more and more and more. And so rather than teaching you to commit yourself, it's teaching, it's actually destroying your commitment, instincts, practices, muscles, and mechanisms. Mm. So the, the, the best way is to resist as much as possible and to try and use this as a tool of spiritual formation, dealing with your longings, dealing with the angst, pointing you back to Christ, making you deeply uh, reflective on your heart. Those things prepare you to enter into a relationship with someone else, but just doing whatever you want and then saying, I'll settle down. It's like all of the practice for the wrong game, you know? Mm. Okay, John, that was, that's so good. And I mean, these are the questions that people want to have answered that yeah. they are really afraid to talk about. Yeah, I mean, sure. they're afraid to ask their, their friends, guys and girls, like, how do we actually address this? And they're afraid to definitely go to a pastor and bring that up. So thank you for addressing that for us Not directly. Not my people. <laughs> <laughs> really? Not oh. at all. They're oh like, my yeah, gosh, we'll man. send you this email. <laughs> no, man, people. People talk about this stuff all the time. I mean, I mean, if yeah. you don't talk about, if you don't talk about this, what are you talking about? This is, if your, if people's needs are not met with biblical answers, they right. will just form their opinions from the world, and it will revo- it will result in spiritual deformation, not formation. Mm. So I'm I'm happy to talk about whatever you know. Mm. And you think similarly because masturbation is one thing, but then when we get into porn, which we've done a series yes. now on porn. Okay. And the science of porn and how it affects your brain and yes. how this is, it's similar, right? It's, and that is like a destructive thing that is highly affecting our culture today. The statistics are crazy and awful. It's and- a, it's, I mean, it's a plague. Mm, it's yeah. a plague. Yeah. I mean, in, in that talk I gave, I'm just like, I think I saw growing up like four static images of yeah. topless women. And that was mm. like the... It, that was all the the images of women in my mind. Yeah. And the typical kid in his pocket today has like in has porn that nobody's like can, can comprehend. You can Google one innocent word and it brings up a plethora of things you so would never imagine. I've got like a all the, I've got covenant eyes filters on my stuff. Mm-hmm. And um <laughs> let me tell you something. Researching a sermon on sexual formation. <laughs> oh my word! It's just yeah. like, gosh, everything just it was just like, wow, oh. this is good. Now, like the vast majority of it's blocked, but I was just like, I can't even imagine. Now, the thing that disturbs me um, is, and I, I don't think I, I did all of this in the in the morning talk on sexual formation. I did a whole thing on porn, and then people were like that on its own was so overwhelming. Mm. You've got to cut it out. Wow. It was just too much. So on Sunday night, which is the the podcast, I didn't really go into it, but I, I'm just absolutely heartbroken, um, and how this is just destroying people. It's destroying people's lives. I mean, it's just it's gutting. It's yeah. killing relationships yeah. and love and how we view men and women. I yeah. mean, because women struggle with it too, and that's yeah, when sure. I talked to. Um, Clay Olson, he's the founder of Fight the New Drug, but he did. Yeah, that was a great, that's a great site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, yeah, he talked about how it's staggeringly how much women are affected by it too. And we can't, it's not just a male driven issue. So we have to recognize that women are also affected by this and that the industry has found ways to appeal porn to women as well now. I mean, and so it's staggering, but then what's tragic to me is then how, how deep even women get into it. And then it destroys their sense of self. They, they decide after being desensitized over and over, they get into extremely violent porn, which is what more typically males start out with a little bit more aggressive. Yeah, what's so violence. crazy is like porn's not real. Yeah, it's not real. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, name another area in our lives where people take something that is total fantasy mm. and then try and live that out in their everyday life. I mean, I, I actually just can't think of like quite another issue where we just go. I know this is not real. I know this is not quite how it works, but now I'm going to take this into the most intimate part of my life. So like the, the shaping of sexual tastes right. is like so disturbing, mm. you know? And so like the, the amount of uh, like uh, erectile dysfunction is like unless I, yeah. unless I do something violent to a woman or it gets really weird, I can't even get an erection. I mean like that's we're destroying our sexuality. Oh, completely. Yeah. The stats that Clay gave in a previous interview was – just incredible about even teenagers, 16 to 21, experience vast amounts of erectile dysfunction. Now. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, yeah. I mean, my son's about to turn 18 next week and I, I sat him down and I made him listen to all of these talks. Mm. And, uh, and so I made him give me a presentation I had, mm. all, and at the end of it, I said, well, what did you think? He said, Dad, I don't want erectile dysfunction in my 20s. <laughs> That's just like, he, like that struck him. Yeah. It's like, wow, an old man's problem happening to teenagers 
people in their 20s is like, this is deeply formative stuff. Mm, deeply tragic. Okay, John, I've taken yes. so much of your time and yes. I have, I would have so much more to talk to you about, yeah. but we're just going to wrap up here. Okay. Um, so I asked everyone the same question towards the end of our interview. So I'm going to ask you the same thing, unless you have any other last final thoughts that you feel like you want to share with us before we wrap up here. No, I think I, I would just say this, though. It seems yeah. very, very obvious that, but I just want to point out in the Gospels the mercy Jesus shows to sexual failure. Mm. His Jesus is just so kind uh, to people who are, you know, they're in inappropriate relationships or, you know, Jesus' treatment of the sinful woman. And so I'm not trying to hold up some bar of Christian morality and then beat people down when they fail yeah. against it. I mean, I, I I want people to live in holiness because I think it's life-giving. I think it prepares people for relationships better. But I just always point people back to Jesus. Yeah. You know, So if people are out there and they just feel like they're failures or they've just screwed up or they're doomed because of past mistakes, I just always want to point people back to the mercy of Jesus. Mm-hmm. The very last thing, John, I'm going to ask uh-huh. you that I ask everyone is what is one nugget of dating advice you could give us if you just like had a few sentences, just like your top level. And you gave us so much information, just something top level. Uh, I, I think I've already said it, mm-hmm. but it would be this. Get your act together. Mm-hmm. Bring your best whole as, as much as possible self through Jesus to another person to give your life away to them. Some Nobody else will fulfill you, complete you, fix you. So I feel like so many people don't do the hard work personally of developing themselves, self-awareness, discipline, habits, you know, practices, like getting their life together mm. and then saying, how do I bring the gift of my self-awareness and my, my self-discipline and my self-reflection to another person to advance the kingdom? Mm. So I think, you know, what we actually need is not better dating. We need better people. We need mm. better Christians. Oh. And that those people coming together will build better marriages and better relationships. But right now we're using it as a Band-Aid for our own brokenness or we're medicating our own uh, brokenness. And so it would be... Mm. Focus on becoming a, a, a skillful disciple of Jesus mm. and bring your discipleship skill with someone else so that together you can advance the kingdom of God. Mm. That's it. Yeah. So much to marinate on today. I'm so thankful to have you on, John. And thank it, you for having me. This here has been in, so exciting. Here in sunny Los Angeles. It's been amazing. So I know you were riding birds climb. earlier. Oh I, they need to get those in New York. Although I think that may be like hazardous. I don't want to say that. And then next month, bird launches in New York. I, I had a, I had a, series of bird disasters but a lot of fun a <laughs> yeah. lot of fun yeah they're so much fun for anyone who doesn't know they're like little scooters i don't know they're not in all parts of the country but they're super yes. fun here in yeah. santa monica okay john if people want to find you where the, can they find your church their, your podcast where they can connect with you oh yes yeah, so, uh, any of uh, your books <laughs> yeah okay so our church's website is church.nyc okay yeah so you can go on there That's you can easy. go to our teaching and uh, follow around on the uh, the Twitter and the Instagram. Mm-hmm. I'm at John Tyson, J O N T Y S O N. Amazing. And I do have a new book that just came out called "The Burden Is Light: Liberating Your Life from the Tyranny of Performance and Success." Ooh. You can get that on Amazon. Ooh, incredible! All right, John, thank you so much. No worries, joy to be on here. Okay, you guys, who's about to go listen to the John Tyson Controversial Jesus series like now? You can find it on Church of the City New York podcast. I highly recommend listening. Also, all of his books are amazing, but definitely go check out his latest one, The Burden is Light. There were so many golden nuggets of truth from John, but something I love that he said was, what we need is not better dating. We need better people, better Christians, and those people coming together to build better marriages and better relationships. But right now, we are using dating as a band-aid for our own brokenness. Ooh, that is some hard truth right there, but my goodness, is it ever true. Also with singles, I think it's our responsibility to, as John said, cultivate holy ambition for the kingdom of God as a single. Let's not waste our time of singleness. This is a time to ask God burning questions that you might not understand and to do many of the things that you can only do really in singleness. Let's do it. I cannot be more thankful for your support of the Heart of Dating podcast. I am blown away by your rankings, reviews, messages, all of it. Also, if you like this podcast, would you please consider giving us a review? It helps us immensely and we cannot thank you more. Until next time, friends. 
This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.